Our next speaker started his social message career in downtown Los Angeles when he joined a company club at Union Oil. Through the benefits of Toastmasters, he gained five promotions professionally. In 1990-91, he served as District 52 as their district governor. He and his team led District 52, which had not been distinguished for the previous three years to distinguished status. But he is more proud of the fact that this was the first year in four years in a row that the district was distinguished, showing the example of carry over leadership. By the time he decided to run for the board of directors, he was now a member of Founders District, and that is where he ran from. For, after serving two years on the board of directors as the international director, he was elected to executive office, 2001 International Convention in Anaheim, California. He was elected as president of Toastmasters International. He continues to serve our organization and as an active member of four clubs, an officer in three of those clubs and is currently mentoring 14 top three district leaders around the world. Certainly, I know he is a friend of District 12 as he has been here to help train in various aspects. Please help me by welcoming distinguished Toastmaster, past international president, Alfred Herzing. Thank you, Mr. Toastmaster, Madam International Director, fellow Toastmasters and friends, good evening. Thanks for sticking with me to the end. Uh, tonight, I want to quickly go through my story. I don't have quite the resume that Roberta has, but boy, that was amazing. <laughs> I will share with you some views on leadership, and then I wish to open the floor for questions because maybe you have questions and how often do you get a chance to have a past international president answer your questions, so I will give you that opportunity. I first joined Toastmasters, as my introduction mentioned, by joining a corporate club. And this is the benefit of having so many clubs around the world because I joined when I was in my 20s. So you can see all the gray here there. So clearly I was a young man when I joined in my 20s. I was just starting my professional career. I was not looking for extracurricular activities, but the club was at my business, at my company. It met during lunchtime. I had lunch. So when a colleague invited me, I went. And had I not been invited to that club that Beverly Andrews had chartered, I don't know if I ever would have joined Toastmasters and my life would have been so much less valued than because of the Toastmasters experience I've had. I was immediately impressed by the Toastmasters organization and especially the leadership aspect. And I don't mean just the club officers, but even being the Toastmaster of the meeting and running a meeting, I was very impressed immediately with the leadership aspect of Toastmasters. And very soon I was recruited, recruited <laughs> to be a club officer. And I remember at one point I was the VP membership and we had a, a new member that was very upset and talked to our president about the fact that we had the audacity to schedule her in advance for duties at the next meeting. She wanted the club to wait for her to show up and then she would tell us what duties she would do. Well, I've always had a strong value of the value of our program. And so I told the president, I said, maybe you don't want me to talk to her <laughs> because what I told her was that membership in this organization is a privilege and you only learn by participating. And so it is part of our duties that we will get rotated amongst the duties and the VP education cannot wait for your Royal Highness to give, anoint her that you can now have this role for the next meeting. <laughs> From the club, I went on to serve as an area governor, was the title back then, was very successful in that. Uh, when back in those days, the, area, the district just focused on speech contests. So when I had my area council meetings, we met to plan speech contests. And we had an amazing speech contest. We had two back then. In the fall of the speech contest, we had 60 people in attendance. We made $400 in profit because I had an opportunity drawing contest amongst my clubs. By every measure of success, of, uh, by every measure, the meeting was a success. And then we as an area council didn't meet till it was time to plan the spring contest. And at the end of the year, the district was not distinguished. And a light bulb came on to me. I went, wait a minute, we spent so much time and energy as a district. 
on, on uh, something that's not even a critical success factor. And I was very, very lucky that that year that I was an area director, and by the way, becoming an area director, it opened up a whole new world of Toastmasters to me. I finally realized there was something beyond my club. I realized that we were really part of an international organization. And we were lucky enough to have a presidential visit. And it was John Favell from New Zealand that came to visit us. And he was just so inspiring. And I was just in awe of him. And I thought, boy, if that is the product of our leadership development program, I want to pursue leadership in Toastmasters. And so I moved into the top three. I went through the chairs there, as was mentioned in my introduction. Uh, when I became district governor, our district had not been distinguished the past three years. Nobody on my team knew what it was like to be a member of a, pre of a distinguished district. And I wanted to set a goal for presidents distinguished. And my team was like, what have you been smoking, Alfred? <laughs> we haven't even been distinguished and you're going for presidents? And I said, well, you know, you can't lead if you don't have anybody on your team following you, right? <laughs> when I train presidents, I tell them, yeah, sure, try being a dictator. Soon you'll find you're a president of a club with nobody in it, big deal. <laughs> so I agreed that we would set a goal for select distinguished. I would not aim just for distinguished. To me, that was too dangerous. And I said, if this team with our talent can't make this, then there's no way that we will have been successful. And at the end of March, we were third from the bottom in the world. And already everybody was talking about next year, next year. Well, you know, we're leaving the district better than I found, we'd found it. I'd heard that stupid story the last three years. And I'm like, no. And I reiterated, if this team with our talent can't make it, then we cannot say we were successful. Nothing less would be acceptable. We redoubled our efforts, and not only did we finish distinguished, we were number two in the region. And as was mentioned in my introduction, I, uh, that was the first of four years in a row that the district was distinguished. And that was very exciting for me. And at that point, I went into semi-retirement. Uh, my spouse at the time did not appreciate all the time I was spending on Toastmasters away. The next step would be international director, but it was like it was not even on the table. But I had two mentors that worked on me and that worked on her for many years, Lydia Boyd and Frank Poyet. And between the two of them, they created that opportunity. And eventually I was given the green light. I did run for the International Board of Directors as an international director. I'm very proud of the fact that I was the first international director candidate since Don Inch that was unopposed from our region. Uh, the many of you might know Don, but you the younger folks won't recognize. He was the voice of Toastmasters for many years and announced the parade of flags and the introductions to the members. But uh, I decided to run. However, in Region 2 history, you know, this is a thing when you get us old timers here, you learn some history lessons. We had had a series of people that were not nominated win by running from the floor. And so I'm a, I'm a closet comic. And so my joke during my campaign was, even though I'm the only nominated candidate, because I am nominated, I'm the underdog in this race. <laughs> and so I was elected and I had the honor of serving and, and serving was such an honor to be a member of this international organization, the international board. And at the end of that term, we were going to have one of my classmates was going to run for what was then third vice president, which was the executive progression to international president. His name was John Howard from Utah. Just a great, great guy. He was just an amazing, and all of us in our class of international directors, we 100% supported him. He, we knew would be fantastic, and we didn't know who else was going to announce, but for us, he was our choice. Sadly, uh, John passed away in August, just a couple weeks prior to the International Convention. And it just really took the wind out of our sails. Our class, again, had a real issue, even with that board meeting, missing our, our good close friend. So uh, at the International Convention, three, well, three, <laughs> three people announced they were running for third vice president. And at the president's dinner dance, I had Four, that's where the four gesture comes in. Four past international presidents separately come to me and say, Alfred, 
we need you to run. I know three people have already announced, but we need you to run. Boy, when you have four past international presidents come to you and ask you to do something, it gets your attention. <laughs> but I had to think about it. I had to go home. I had to talk to my family, make sure they understood what they were signing up for. It's a five-year commitment. And especially the year as president, when you're doing those presidential visits, it is intense. So I also had to get my work to buy in that they would also agree to this. So we got that, we had the discussions and it was near the end of September, I announced and I, I called Terry McCann who was the executive director at the time and I let him know. And he said, Alfred, come on, you decided months ago you were running. I go, no, I literally just decided. <laughs> By then, one of the other candidates had, run, had pulled out. So there were three of us. And I say we weren't running against each other. We were just running for the same position. And that, that convention was held right there in District 12 in Palm Desert. And uh, Roberta was a key member of my team. I will never, never be able to thank her enough for how amazing she was supporting me. And so many of you too were also on my team. And I'm very proud of the fact that we won on the first ballot in a three-way race. So that was really one of the most amazing moments in my life. And then I went through the chairs and then of course I was lucky to become international president. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I was international president when 9-11 happened. And my theme was take control of your destiny. And so we got on empty planes just a few weeks after that terrible event to start our, our district visits because I said, we're not letting the terrorists win. We're going, the districts are expecting us. And they were so grateful that we did. And in fact, our first visit was to New York, not New York City, but upstate New York. And it's just a great, great time with all those people. I also had one overseas trip, which my son at the time, he was, he was about 14. He was a little uh, concerned about it because it was a Muslim country. And we had our presidential visit to Kuala Lumpur in Malaysia. And again, the, the local folks just really helped us so much, was just fantastic. My theme was take control of your destiny. And uh, folks there, you know, you, something terrible has happened but what are you going to do about it? You know, we could say the same thing right now about COVID, you know, COVID is impacting all of us. Are you gonna use that as an excuse or is it gonna be your inspiration? And I ended up giving a presidential citation uh, to Robert Shore, who is the area director or governor from Ground Zero in New York City, because he found new meeting locations for all of his clubs and the area finished as the distinguished area that year. And um, my view on leadership is we have to be servant leaders and we're in a position of power. We need, we're there to serve us. Club officers, you're there to serve the members to help them achieve their goals. Air directors, you're there to help to serve your club officers to help them serve their members and on through. So the time I became international president, I was at the bottom of the organization. I was serving all of the members worldwide. And I think it's also important that we as leaders that have that position, we need to make sure that we're doing it for good. And the reason I got so excited about Toastmasters is because I learned how to motivate and influence volunteers. And I found that directly translated to the workplace. If you ever went to one of your employees said, just do it because I'm the boss, your relationship is over. And so the motivation and influence skills I learned as a Toastmasters leader directly helped me in my career. And I know in at least two of the positions I earned after becoming a Toastmaster, the leadership skills I learned as a Toastmaster were directly involved in me getting those positions. So fellow Toastmasters, that's my story. That's what I believe. Be a servant leader, serve others, use your position for good. If somebody has a problem, we all have seen managers in our life and leaders in our life that when a problem comes up, they choose to ignore it. Oh, we'll just ignore it and hope it goes away. It doesn't work that way. And I'm not that way in business and I'm not that way in leadership. Those of you that know me, I'm pretty vocal when I see something that I don't agree with. And that's just, I feel what the role of a leader is. 
when you have great leaders like Esther and Roberta and Roz, all these people that have been there and done that, uh, some people will say, oh, well, we're not in position now, so we just need to let them learn the lessons. I went off that cliff, and I know that cliff's there, but let them find it themselves. And my position is no. <laughs> we need to let them know that cliff is there, but if they choose to go over it, that's fine. It's their decision, but at least I pointed it out to them. And with that, I open the floor if anybody has any questions. And Tom, if you could help me, because I'm watching... Maryland to make sure I don't go long. In fact, it is nine o'clock, so maybe we better not do We that. want to hear from you. So All right. Questions? All right, and no questions? Ralph, I see Ralph. Ralph. Yeah, uh, Alfred, what do you see as the number one challenge for Toastmasters International right now? For me, the two biggest challenge I see long-term for the organization is number one, pathways. Only 50% of new members are even signing up for the program. And with the old programs, you got your manuals, your VPE scheduled you, you were off and running. But if we don't get new members engaged, there's no way they're going to retain. The second is online meetings. In my opinion, where people are not growing in these online meetings like we do in person. And so I think long-term, I've already had members in some of my clubs say, until you meet in person, I'm out. When you meet again in person, I'll be happy to rejoin. But they were just not getting the same value out of these clubs. Hmm. And with that, I return contact back to Mr. Tom Jameson. <laughs>